All right, so I guess we're doing this. Today, we're taking a look at Henry Cavill, aka Superman. He was one of the most requested names for the Analyzing Celebrity Faces series, and it's pretty clear to see why. He's getting a lot of traction in today's film industry, from being known for his roles in Superman, obviously, and also Geralt of Rivia in the Witcher series, and it may seem like there isn't a lot of depth to analyzing Henry's stereotypically attractive Y actor with basic attractive features, conventionally attractive features type of analysis. But we can still take a look at what makes him so classically handsome and also talk about facial robusticity, the masculineness of his face, which is something that we haven't gotten the chance to talk about with other faces. And of course, no face is flawless, so Henry is in fact human like the rest of us, not Kryptonian, contrary to popular belief and the roles and personas that he likes to upkeep. However, this video is going to focus on what makes him classically and scientifically attractive by following the tenets of facial attractiveness. The first thing that catches the eye is Henry's general facial shape and proportions. He has a stereotypically squared off, wide and masculinized face. A couple of proportions result in the overall look. And firstly, his facial thirds are distributed so that his middle third, where the nose occupies, is the smallest proportion of the face. This is usually attractive because it gives the illusion of a smaller and proportionally shorter nose. And we can see how his proportion seems to vary if he grows out his beard. The lower proportion of the face vertically lengthens and further masculinizes that distribution. Also, facial hair is just masculinizing in and of itself. Henry's entire mid-face region is quite compact, with a facial width to height ratio approaching two times, meaning his facial width from zygion to zygion, or the cheekbone to cheekbone, is almost two times as wide as the height of his mid-face region. I like to explain it like, think of the <laughs> headlights of a Bugatti, you know, um, a Lamborghini, any type of sports car, think of how they're shaped, wide, narrow, and aggressive looking. And there's a reason why that tends to look good in masculinized faces as well, for the same logic that it looks dominant and aggressive. In general, this is an attractive and masculinizing trait because it signals strong dentofacial growth or bone structure, both laterally and forward, and is usually associated with high cheekbones, like in Henry's case. A study by Catton and Dixon sought to examine the sexual dimorphism so the masculineness and the feminineness as it relates to the bizygomatic width or the cheekbone width, and they found stark sexually dimorphic differences in that specific measurement, meaning that the bizygomatic width seems to be the most correlated with things like shoulder width, butt circumference, chest circumference, and head breadth. And if your face is wide, generally your body is also wide and stocky too. Now, it's also highly correlated with weight, which can affect all of those things as well. And we've seen all experienced how putting on a few pounds can really puff out the cheeks and make your face look wider, so there's no surprises there. However, the width of the cheeks could also be an example of masculine dimorphic development, where more masculine men would commonly have a thicker neck and chest, but also a thicker and wider face. Henry definitely does possess all of those traits. Henry's midface is also in itself a perfect one-to-one -one square, meaning it doesn't look overly squished or long, and that's generally attractive. Then of course, the upper and lower part of the face also contributes to that squared off look. His bigonial width or the jaw width is slightly less than his cheekbone width, and it's also not overly wide or narrow. And so there's a general trend approaching where everything is quite shapely without being overly deviant, which leads into the idea of facial averageness. Henry's bitemporal width or the forehead width is also quite similar at about 90% of his cheekbone width and it gives that 90-100-90 look that produces a harmonized and masculinized facial contour. There is general agreement between his facial shape and the proportions, where no third of the face seems too notably narrow or wide, and that's a significant takeaway for why Henry has such a shapely looking face. Mr. Cavill also likes to experiment with a lot of different hairstyles and facial hair lengths, and thus his look does vary a lot. For example, if he has grown out the sides of his head, the bitemporal width may seem a bit wider than the middle and lower parts of his face, and similarly, longer facial hair gives the illusion of widening out the jaw. Grown out sideburns gives the illusion of wider cheekbones, and I think you can all understand how this can apply to your own face, where you can adjust the proportions of your face simply by the hair on your face. Playing around with these factors to one's advantage is actually quite overlooked in making positive glow-ups to your face. Henry also has a great foundation, so he can generally pull off every hairstyle he tries, and as we've explained in previous videos regarding the science of hairstyles, 
Research generally shows that attractive faces can pull off any hairstyle because they have the right set of bone structure and facial robusticity to look attractive regardless of what the hairstyle really looks like. But going back to Henry's case, his curlier hair texture can also add width to the face depending on the length and it also adds an element of uniqueness and flair to the face and straighter hair generally wouldn't achieve that effect. Perhaps Henry's strongest facial feature are the eyes. They have virtually flawless spacing and dimorphic markers, which in simple speak just means that they're very masculinized looking. We've touched on in the past their eyes being one eye apart as a generally accepted assessment of eye spacing. And it doesn't give the whole picture, but it is usually a positive thing to have your eyes be spaced correctly. Henry's eyes are exactly one eye width apart, and additionally his interpupillary distance, or exactly how it sounds, the distance between the inner pupils of the eyes is harmoniously positioned relative to his total facial width. And in other words, his eyes appear neither too wide set or close set, but right in the middle. Interpupillary distance is also a sexually dimorphic trait, similar to cheekbone width, according to Rat and Natal, but men overall just have wider facial features on average. His eyes are three times wider than they are tall, which again is neither too narrow or too rounded looking. And this is becoming quite a trend where generally Henry's facial proportions are quite average in the sense that they lie right in the mathematical center of hot and cold. Some slight upper eyelid exposure and eye bags are not traditionally thought of as attractive because it leads to a tired or worn out look, but in Henry's case it may work to humanize his eye area or else he'll just look sculpture-like and robotic. And while his eyes are deep set, it is mainly from the brow ridge protrusion where his maxillary or the mid face region is quite forward grown but it does lack some bone or fatty deposits right under the eye. This could be just genetic, but it also appears to have gotten worse with age as those fatty deposits start to wane down. Brownridge protrusion is another dimorphic quality and it's exactly as it sounds. Our caveman ancestors had incredibly prominent brow ridges because they would head bash each other. Modern humans don't have much of a need for that, but it is still a remnant of masculinized faces where the extreme masculinized faces like Henry almost have it found exclusively in men. Brow bone protrusion is highly correlated with having the eyebrows closer to the eyes according to Goldstein and Katowitz. In fact, it probably causes it. This is demonstrable in Henry's case where there is little to no distance between his eye line and his eyebrows. And this gives a more aggressive, again, Lamborghini looking face. <laughs> That's the only way I can explain it. Since dimorphism is attractive because it signals health and fertility, traits like these that make men look like men and women look like women especially attractive, perhaps even more so for the male group. You see, the brow bone is literally the human version of antlers and we made a video with our biologist Simon Groom as to why humans would have ever needed to have these aggressive facial features to protect themselves from other humans trying to, again, head bash them. With the brow bone protrusion, there is a difference in racial and genetic components as well, but in general, having more pronounced brow bones is usually associated with masculinity. The last and finally most obvious thing we're going to be talking about is the Superman-esque jaw, and that allows Henry to play the bold and uncompromising characters that he does. When you think of a Greek demigod from the film Immortals, Clark, Ken or Gerald of Rivia, that kind of jaw is almost a prerequisite. I mean, think about it, you can't really have a weak jawline <laughs> if you're playing a superhero. It just doesn't make sense. Typecasting is a real thing, and to convincingly star in the roles requires having a hyper-westernized masculine face. And I say westernized because in the West, we have a preference for facial robusticity, basically sharp, angular features. In the East, not so much. His ramus length, which is this section of the lower jaw here, is likely in the 99th percentile and this hyper-masculinizes the lower third because ramus length is a strong sexually dimorphic indicator. It's so sexually dimorphic that we've discussed in the past how a skeleton can be identified of its sex with a high degree of certainty just using this one facial trait alone. A near vertical ramus combined with a forward grown lower jaw gives Henry a low gonial angle or the jaw angle of around 120 degrees. The proportion of the ramus to the mandible body or the lower jaw shows us that his ramus is long in comparison. His mandible and chin are also very forward grown and though it remains harmonious it doesn't look odd or overly deviant like he has some kind of orthodontic anomaly. In the past, we've also shown from orthodontic analysis that the intersection of lines across the front of the jaw is a powerful indicator of lower third attractiveness, according to Saponara et al. 
Despite the study applying to female models, the frontal jaw angle is actually quite a strong universal attractiveness indicator with the angle of men may be one to two degrees lower on average due to having wider chins, but it still does apply with a high degree of certainty. Most attractive men and women have a jawline in frontal view that does not appear too flat or too inclined and narrow. In Henry's case, his jaw is actually a bit on the flatter side, but it is still very reasonably attractive. Another commonly used cephalometric assessment is to compare this measurement to an angle between the alar base or the nose and the outer corner of the eye called the lateral canthus. Usually these two angles should be pretty close to one another with a deviation of no more than 15 degrees to maintain harmony. Henry is about 9 degrees off if we take it from the nose base, so he's not doing too bad there either. However, compared to the study's method of the alar or the nose wing, he falls outside of that ideal range. In the interest of time, we're going to breeze through a couple of the commonly used dentofacial assessments that an orthodontist would use to look at a person's bone structure. Henry doesn't have any significant chin recession or weakness, and if we take the Frankfurt horizontal plane, which is just a line that runs from the ear through the orbital bones of the under eye, and then run a line from the chin perpendicular to that, the chin should slightly surpass the labella or the nasian at minimum to not be considered recessed. Also, the gonion, or the lowest corner of the back jaw, should be below a line drawn from the mouth parallel to the Frankfurt plane. Henry passes all of these tests with impeccable dentofacial development, and even his lips have a pronounced cupid bow, which is considered an attractive trait, and you may notice that people with fetal alcohol syndrome don't actually have a cupid's bow. And that's why that is also a commonly attractive trait, because it indicates you don't have any genetic malformations. A line drawn from the base of the chin, aka the pagonian, to the nasal tip is very commonly used in dentofacial assessment. This is called the Ricketts E-plane, where Henry does well by this test. And his larger nasal protrusion, or the strength of his nose, harmonizes well with the strength of his chin in comparison. So it's no surprise that Henry Cavill is probably one of the arguably better looking men on the planet. Both cephalometrically and by western beauty standards, he fits the bill of the attractive protagonist. While the western standard of an attractive Caucasian man can be quite superficial in terms of analysis, Henry Cavill is not a normally attractive man, and he's definitely in the upper thresholds of look in producing a face that is not very commonly seen. And with that being said, if you'd like to learn more about your facial development, if you have the Henry Cavill jawline and a general assessment of your features, how you can improve the way that you look, or what you can do to look different, you can have an assessment performed by a team of doctors and dentists, much like we broke it down here over at the Coops website. As always, I'll catch you in the next one.